this is not an episode of Side Character Quest. Just getting that out of the way right up top. Um, recently, I've been guesting on a few other shows, and as a thank you for your patience while waiting for episode 99, uh, and also as, you know, hey, it's Thanksgiving, people are going to be traveling a lot, I figured I would share with you uh, one of those guest spots. This is going to be an episode of the DM's Book Club, where the hosts basically review, talk about, discuss different books, I guess. Uh, books is sometimes a strong word. Uh, written materials. And talk about how to use them in your own games. And um, I listened to a bunch of episodes uh, prior to going on, and I really enjoyed their Zeroth Level e Adventure episode, and also their episode about D&D Sidekick Rules. So if you enjoy this, um, I'll have a link in the show notes. You can go check out their show. Yeah, or you can just, you know, type in your podcast app. You know how these things work. Anyway, uh, Fiona and I talk about First Blush, which is appropriately a one shot that's meant to introduce people to one player, one DM D&D. &D. Um, I think it, well, I'll hold off on giving a review. Uh, you can listen to the thing and make up your own mind. You'll you'll see how I feel about it. Um, if you want to hear more from me, I also recently was on a couple episodes of Finish It, uh, which is also going to be in the show notes. And that's a show about uh, pick your path books. Did you know that the name Choose Your Own Adventure is trademarked? Well, uh, it's, it's about pick your path books. Um, and it was a lot of fun as well. Again, it'll be in the show notes, not dropping that here, but you know, you can find it. Uh, <laughs> thank you again for your patience as we work on those upcoming episodes. SCQ is, I, I don't do it for any other reason than I love to make it. And I really want to make the episodes uh, as good as possible. Um, yeah, I mean, this is, it's not like, this isn't a job for me. Uh, in fact, it is a, uh, it, it is a financial loss. Uh, so it is purely something I'm doing for the love of it. Um, episode 99 is going to be the start of a short two episode quest. Uh, and episode 101 will be a longer episode uh, that I think is going to be, I think it's going to be seven episodes. I'd have to go back and check. Um, but yeah, they are both, I think people are going to really enjoy them. And yeah, uh, if you, in the meantime, if you want to say hi, um, if you have any compliments to past guest players that you would like me to pass along, uh, if you have a insult for Eli, you want me to pass, I'm just kidding. If you have a really nice thing to say to Eli, you could pass that along to me and I will, I will make sure that it gets to him. Shoot an email over to sidecharacterquest at gmail.com. Um, Eli or anybody else that's been on the show. Uh, hey, it's Thanksgiving is right around the corner. Enjoy DM's Book Club. Hello and welcome to the DM's Book Club, a podcast where we read about some Dungeons and Dragons and discuss how we might include it in our role-playing campaigns. So with me, I've got a very, very special guest with me here today. We've got Ty from SideQuest Podcast. Hello, Ty. How are you? That would actually be Side Character Quest. Well, that is embarrassing. I will try that again. <laughs> uh, we'll keep it in the recording. So Side Character Quest. Very excited. Uh, so Ty, tell us all about Side Character Quest. Yeah, so Side Character Quest, it is an actual play Dungeons & Dragons 5e show. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we dip into other systems, but hey, uh, more or less, 5e is, is where we stick. Mm -hmm. And what makes it different is, yes. um, although everything is um, set in a single you know, shared universe, a shared setting, each different quest is following a different player character and 99% of the time it's just one player character mm -hmm. so we bring somebody in take them on an adventure through this shared world mm -hmm. and then move on to the next story and it's really fun because you know you can dip in and listen to just one of the adventures or if you like it then you can listen to more and as you listen to more you're mm -hmm. like oh I remember that NPC mm -hmm. they're treating that guy like 
they're an ally, but I know that that NPC from that other quest is actually a bad guy. Oh no. So lots of, lots of overlap. That's really fun to play with. That's so cool. Cause it feels like a very unique concept. Cause obviously we are consider our, our PC, our player characters as the hero sort of thing. We don't tend to, it's as selfish and sort of introverted or sort of self-centeredness as it is. We tend not to look at those other characters that appear in the side bits. So it feels like to be a, a mixture of sort of almost like Game of Thrones style. You've got all these different narratives overlapping yeah. slightly. But also, you, in a way, I, I don't know if you ever read Cloud Atlas by David Mitchell as well. Where I not. So I, I will say your podcast is nothing like that, but it just reminds me of it. <laughs> it's this idea in Cloud Atlas that you have 10 stories and each story mm-hmm. is sort of in each of them. They sort of stop halfway. Yeah. But it's the, sa- the same people are living through the stories. And some of them will have very small parts of the story. Some of them will be all about them. And it's just a way to connect the narratives in a way. But it's yeah, I love the idea that you as a listener would know a lot more than mm-hmm. the, the the people that play it, which is fascinating. So, well, let's start right at the beginning then. So, how did you get into role playing games, and then how did you come up with the concept of side character quest? I got into D and D. I think I, I technically played it when I was in like when I was maybe eleven with mm-hmm. my uh, my brother, and it did not go well uh, because Never you know, older brother little brother dynamics yep. not great for a a D and D situation always. But I didn't really get into it until college. I played mm-hmm. with a large group of people, like eight people at my first Whoa. table, just too many. Too many. Um, <laughs> eventually, we narrowed that down to three or four players and then the DM. Um, so for a table of like four or five people that has stuck around even, you know, even now I'm still playing games with them yeah. uh, off pod. What led to me starting side character quest specifically There was a few things. One is I just generally wanted to do um, podcasting just for fun to challenge myself, do something new. Mm -hmm. Uh, I also wanted to be able to do a game that did not rely on having, you know, three or four people always available. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I can, you know, expect a large commitment from somebody for two months of recording and then we're done uh, was very, very helpful logistically. And then I had a third point as well. <laughs> I don't remember what that was. No, I, I think that second point and the first point, well, because I, I similarly, I got into podcasting purely because I wanted to challenge myself and mm-hmm. that I had a lot of RPGs and I didn't see my friends enough. So those sort of three yeah. pillars sort of interconnected as well. So the world yourself, did you build that with your friends initially or did, was that a whole sort of thing yourself? Because obviously it's the same world, but you have different players come in and, you know, like you yeah. said, only here for a month or so. Do you, is it something that is organic in the sense of it's always still being created or have you got a, like a big set overarching thing that's going on? I have an incredibly hard time pre-planning things. Uh, <laughs> I can I, that's why I do. I do. That's why I do homebrew. Mm-hmm. I have a hard time, you know, reading through an entire booklet and getting it all locked to my brain. And I have a hard time writing out everything in advance. So when I started SCQ, I came up with a very vague history of the world uh, mm-hmm. that I could have in my brain. I came up with a central plot. Like the, you know, we're talking about side character quest. I came up with the main character's quest that is happening in the background at all times. And then I drew a map and did the classic draw map, leave empty spaces. And so whenever I would start a, you know, I'd bring somebody on, I would have people pitch characters they wanted to play. And Mm -hmm. then, you know, if they had an idea of a, of a particular type of quest they would like to go on, or if Mm -hmm. they just had, here is a character idea that I have, Mm -hmm. then I would work back and forth with them to figure out, okay, where does this fit in the pre-existing world? Cool. If it doesn't fit in the pre-existing world, what can we add to Mm. the world to make this fit? Yeah. And that's been so much fun, like making everything fit. And at this point, things are still flexible enough, but also fleshed out enough that it's, it's fun, not challenging. If that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Um, definitely. Yeah. From this sort of way of designing your game and sort of talking to other people, it is so flexible and so creative and collaborative compared to traditionally, and I say that in quotation marks, about we see the game, you know, it is the DM, their world, their campaign, and the players are, are playing in it and they can affect mm-hmm. it, but it's not as much like they create stuff. So the fact that you have that discussion about what kind of quest they want to go on, even if it could just be like, 
I just want to go on like an errand quest or anything like that. That's still, like you said, yeah. you have to work out. That's that's really interesting. And yeah, I just to date then, how many people have come into your world Ooh. and and not ruined it? That's not the way I say it. <laughs> uh, but have uh, made their mark on your world? Would you say? Um, let's see. I I would say is we've had somewhere in the realm of. I'm not sure the exact number. I think it's somewhere around 15 Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. that give or take a few. And there are some people who, you know, came in really early on and were able to like, or at any point in the the series, people who slot in, in a very natural way and, you know, come and go. And then I, I can sort of find ways to link their actions into other stuff. But then I've had other people who, especially when somebody is a listener to the show, um, mm. I will work with them to be like, okay, I know that this person is really interested in the Salton Sea as mm-hmm. like a locale. I'm going to come up with a way for their actions to have a dramatic effect on that location, you know, and, and plays out in a very dramatic fashion. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's also really fun though when when somebody doesn't know what's right, going on. Of course, um, yeah. I have a quest that's hasn't been released yet, and I'm going to be vague about it. Be, um, yes, be vague. Yeah. Spoilers, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I w- had so much fun because the person that was coming on, I knew that he didn't know anything about SCQ, and he mm-hmm. was he was like, "Should I listen in advance?" And I was like, "No, no, 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 no." Yeah, I am counting on you to not know what's going on, the listener, long time listeners are going to be listening to this and be like, no, don't do that. Yeah. No, don't do that. That'll be awful. And you won't have any idea. And that'll be wonderful to play mm-hmm. with. And I just love that dramatic irony that you can you can work with. It's something, it's so different. I don't know any other actual players that work with that without the player already knowing mm-hmm. that's the bad guy, that's the villain. Like if you have a, a person that pops up and like a name gets mentioned and only some people would recognize it. It's such a yeah. rare thing to have an actual point. So I think that's such an interesting concept of it. So yeah, kudos for that. Yeah. <laughs> it's very interesting. So then let's talk about the topic you've brought to us today. So what is our topic of choice? We are uh, looking at First Blush, mm-hmm. um, which is a pre-written campaign, a module, I guess, Um for introducing people to the idea of one-on-one D&D mm. adventures. I really wanted something like this. I wish I had had something like this when I first started at SEQ. Mm-hmm. Um, I did not write this. Uh, no. I don't remember the names <laughs> of the, the people off the top of my head. Sorry, I will, I will look for it whilst you are back for time. So I, yeah. for it. <laughs> I would have loved to have something like this because there's so many things that, especially if you listen back to the early arcs of SEQ, you'll hear me kind of figuring out some things mm-hmm. about how to handle one player that if I had read this, I would have been like, oh, of course. It gives you so many little tips on common foibles and you know problems you can run into along the way of, of uh, doing your first one-on-one campaign. It's also set up as like a general introduction to D&D, mm-hmm. uh, like assuming that the player has never played before, mm-hmm. uh, which I thought was really interesting. It feels like... The point of this, and tell me if you agree with with what I'm about to say. I don't remember if they specifically said this, but it feels like the point of this is if someone is in a relationship and they really like (laughs) Dungeons and Dragons and their partner has Mm. never tried it and is intimidated by like a full campaign with like five or six people. And they're like, okay, I'll just do one little adventure for you Mm -hmm. to show you how everything works. Mm -hmm. Does that sound right? You know, I hadn't considered it, but absolutely. So yeah, so this is written by Jonathan and Beth Ball, who run a website called D&D Duet. So you're right, Mm. it's that sort of idea of these one-on-one adventures, like one DM, one player, etc. And it's so true. I had kind of forgotten that phenomena because it never happened with me and my part. (laughs) (laughs) I was too busy already reading the books and going, right, when's my campaign? But we do have that, right? We have that thing where I want them to watch a, a TV show. I really want them to watch that. Here's a board game. I want to get them to that. And it's very overwhelming if you are coming into a group of people who already have that level of knowledge and you don't. 
And I, certainly for me, when I play other RPG games that aren't necessarily uh, Dungeons & Dragons, but aren't games that I don't know very well, mm-hmm. and I've been invited on a stream to do it, I do have that sense of going, oh God, I wish I could um, I could do something about it. So the way I get through it as a player, not knowing the mm-hmm. rules, is improv. And I just I just come up with the weirdest <laughs> character concept and they have to say yes and. Now, obviously, maybe I'm just very charismatic and charming and witty and funny and confident enough to do that. But some people aren't like that. Some people no. want to take part in that sort of thing and they're not sure how. So I think you're right. I think something like this, an introductory adventure for a brand new player to introduce them to all those free pillars and also for maybe for the DM a little bit as well. They're not sure about DMing as well. Yeah. All the way around. Yeah. I've, I've really enjoyed this one because for 20 pages, you get a lot uh, yeah. in it as well. Do you want to run over just the selection of things sure. that are in this? I will. So yes, yeah, so essentially you have a couple of pages at the beginning that talks about the importance of like, why would you run D&D for one person? And it talks about, interesting enough, because we have covered it on our podcast before, we've covered the idea of sidekicks, this idea that having... I listened to that episode. That well, was a really go. good episode. Oh, thank you. But yeah, so this idea that you have a player character with you that can help, so you're not on your own, so that you can have at least a little moment in the spotlight, but at the same time, you can then take a moment out of the spotlight to let something else happen. You also It also introduces this idea of a, a DM player character. Mm-hmm. So this idea is on the same level. So sidekicks are seen as more of a streamlined sort of player character with less features and stuff, but easy to run. So for example, mm-hmm. in this adventure, it suggests that you have your own, the player has their own player character, and then they run the sidekick if they feel comfortable enough to do so. Whereas the DM would obviously run everything else. But then they would also have a DM player character, which could be the person they rescue in it, in the adventure, or it could be the friend as well. Before we go on, I have an issue with DM player characters, not in the sense I've I've been on the receiving end of a bad one, is that for me as a DM, having a player character that's of the same level and and maybe at the same power level of a Mm -hmm. a player character, I worry so much that I know too much. And it's so hard. Right. You know, and, it's and so for hard. you, yeah, I was going to say, how does it, how do you find it? First of all, do you use sidekicks or your own DM character when you're playing one on one in your recordings? I never thought about them in, in terms of sidekick or DM PC until most recently, like reading the uh, the new sidekick rules and listening to your episode um, right. and everything with that. Um, I had never really thought of them in that terms. I had always thought of them as, an NPC that maybe the person could bring along or they could ditch. But yeah, it's, it's always, not important, is it? Yeah, yeah. they just happened to be there. I call them quest help. <laughs> yes. The first few adventures that I did where I had some sort of NPC helper, it was very clear that the NPC helper didn't need to be there. Like they, the person could ditch them. And that was, you know, it wor- worked out great because the person knew the you know, they're subservient. They're not going to be with me all the time. I can't rely on this person as a member of the party. One time I had a, I had an adventure where there was, someone was playing a character that was with their backstory, very like subservient to one of the NPCs, not subservient. That's the wrong word. Uh, like, uh, like indebted to them in a way. Indebted or? to, I guess. Um, where like, there was a person who was a, the, someone was their boss like the npc was their boss right right yeah and they're an employee so there's a bit of a employee, lowest lowest yeah. state there's a status play a little bit Ex- there yeah exactly and so and i found that it was really hard to get a character who wants to be obedient and wants to behave well when they're mm. around this boss to not just let the boss make all the decisions yeah yeah yep, it was yep, yep, yep. very very, very hard. difficult to work with and it's a really tricky balance anytime you introduce somebody especially if they're a an NPC with the same skill set as the player with has all of those abilities. Yeah. It's yeah. just like, it's so much to, to juggle. I, I try nowadays to make any of the, um, any NPCs just like relatively incompetent <laughs> and it works so much better. It just works so much yeah. better. Or they'll have like motivations that very specifically do not, one-to-one align with the player. Right. So, you know, they know that at some point this person might branch off and, and not stay with them. That's interesting. Yeah, because I when I first started out DMing and stuff, I remember talking to somebody who had, like, they would have, again, back in the days where we didn't have sidekicks, the term for yeah. it. They did have, when they were working at it, and they said, oh, we only have three players for this campaign. 
and they were like, look at what the composition of the party was, and nobody was playing healer. So they just uh-huh. created um, what is now obviously a sidekick, but yes. obviously using full credit of a cleric. And all the cleric would do is in battle would just heal people. So there was no role play, no nothing. Just, and this person just called yeah. them a heal bot. Yeah. 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 And I was just a bit like, that. For me, I understand that, but that felt so mechanical, so sort of video gamey, right? Like it's at just... that point, at that point, you just have like a god that's healing them. Like, right. like it's just so it's it feels so pointless. It it just uh, it just kind of like it, again, we disagreed on a couple of things for when when we were talking about it. But I just I just felt that it came away from that going. That feels so sad that you were like, oh, they're going to die easily, uh, so mm-hmm. I'm just going to give them this to help them. I guess it's like, well, you should like. You know, they don't have to, like you said, they don't have to have that alignment. They don't have to do that sort of thing. They can have their own things, but they can just be at a lower level. Uh, they lower, be... lower difficulty battles. If exactly. You want. I saw, I read in, I can't remember which book it was now. I think it was one of the very many, like, uh, my adventure books uh, advice thing, where it said that if you've got lots of NPCs, uh, they could be off screen battling like a, a horde. Mm-hmm. So they don't have to take part in the battle itself, yeah. but they could be off screen and deal with another threat. So if the city is being, uh, there's a siege at the city, they could be like, we're going to go down here good luck and so you focus on what the character's doing and give them sort of thing as well so i know there's different ways of of putting it but yeah for me i just because i i always have thinking of a billion things at once when i'm dming i worry myself is having that barrier between what i know what the character knows and then what i say Mm -hmm. because every like it's happened the other night where i was like i don't say this don't say this and then of course i said oh so the lich now attacks and then i was like Oh, I've not been describing it as a lich, though. Well, they know now. <laughs> yeah. All the faces dropping in the call. I was like, yeah, well. Like, oh, no. Yeah, this is like, much more dangerous than I yeah, thought. I mean, it was pretty deadly. And you're like, oh, well, I've ruined it now. But again, it's just one of those things, talking up to experience, like next time, just don't say, don't say lich, don't say lich. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so it gives you that advice about like uh you know how to use sidekick if they mm-hmm. want to uh dm player character as well and then it just talks about the structure of the adventure where it says like we think about the three pillars in dnd so in case those people who don't know wizards of coast sort of have this big great philosophy i actually quite like it where it talks about role-playing games or the dnd wizards of coast stuff revolves around three things it's uh social interaction exploration and combat and these three sort of make up what it is to play a game of dnd in your campaigns mm-hmm. and sometimes there might be only two of those columns. Uh, maybe one of the three columns has a bit more presence in some of the sessions. So maybe it's a very heavy combat session. Sometimes you obviously have shopping episodes, all that sort of thing. But all three of them, it's what makes sort of uh, your character feel more real is that they take part mm-hmm. in these, these things. So in the adventure, the first blush, it talks about the first part of the adventure is meeting these elements individually. So the first part yes. the first is that you just do some role play. Uh, So then Mm -hmm. second part, you do some combat and then you go to do some exploration, although it's very, very short. (laughs) Yeah, very, very short. And then you're into part two where it combines all three. A quick note on it being very short. I love that this, more so than any adventure I have seen or tried to build, feels like you could legitimately complete it in two hours. Yeah, one session. Yeah, yeah, I thought that as well. (laughs) That's amazing. Like it, 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 you wouldn't think it's as hard as it is, but it mm. it's difficult to to do something like that. So I thought it was it was great that they kept it as a uh, as tight as they did. I yeah, um, I completely agree. Because we've got obviously books that have to come out just now. Obviously we've got uh, the Radiant Citadel that's come out. We've got the Candlekeep Mysteries, and they're all one shots mm-hmm. in quotation marks. Uh, we're still on. They're uh, so long. They're so long. We're on uh, session eight of one of the Radiant Citadel ones. Don't yeah. get me wrong, we're absolutely loving it. But I I thought it will wrap up in two. Uh, but I, it, it's yeah. just so much. There's so much in it i totally agree i was uh I, I also have radiant citadel over on my shelf over there and i was reading through them and i was like these are great mm. i really like these it would take so long to get like it's not that it would take so long like they no. they're they're fair they're short they're speedy they're, it's not like they're full of fluff right no, no that's it's, right they're not a thing that you're going to get through in a breezy evening no. You know, you you might get through it in a, you know, really nice Saturday afternoon. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, a long weekend. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I do not wish to not, not to knock that. No. That's, yeah, we, that we is love a that. Thing. I think yes. but I think we're both uh, circling around that subject of going people need to get in and enjoy it and then be okay to be like, right, I want to leave now rather than having as you were saying before that sort of 
how long a commitment mm-hmm. like for us it's part of our, our monday night games that we will always do dnd in some form yeah. so it's not a problem but if i said oh we're going to have a weekend doing this thing and then we only get through a third of it mm-hmm. i don't want people then to feel obligated to be like well did you enjoy it enough to carry on you know yeah. that's that's yeah. whereas well, you're right with this with the first blush stuff I easily see it as such a quick primer. And I think you're right. I think two hours, I think even an hour and a half, if, yeah. depending on how much people get into the role play of it as well. I, I was just going to say that uh, I recently, um, on the, the episodes of SCQ that side character quest that most recently came out, episode 97 and 98, I designed that to try to be a two episode arc two mm-hmm. episode quest mm-hmm. that, you know, I was bringing somebody in, we would record for, two hours, then we would come back in, record for another two hours. And it was really tough to make Mm -hmm. something that felt to make a done, you know, I tried to make it a, there's, there's a a social stuff in the first episode and then there's dungeon and combat in the second episode. And it is so difficult Mm -hmm. to make something really tight. Uh, And and so it was so refreshing to come through and read this Mm -hmm. and be like, Oh yeah, yeah, this works. This has the whole story arc. It hits everything. The first section of this Mm -hmm. is literally a tutorial, right? That is what is happening. There is a, your player character is being run through a gauntlet that is designed to make them a adventurer. And it is, literally literally a tutorial but they make it fun like it feels it feels like it wouldn't be slap in the face to a player it would be like oh i'm I'm having a good time here um Mm. and that's that's nice um it would be fast but that's not a bad thing yeah i think yeah again like i can imagine for it is definitely built as we were saying earlier it's definitely built for brand new players i think if you're a veteran and you wanted to play one-on-one you would definitely have to add a little bit more to it but there's no problem with that I think what I wanted to point out before we sort of go on to the actual... Oh, yes. Sorry. Like, descri- no, no, no. Description of the adventure. Sorry. Never be sorry. Um, <laughs> so it talks about role play. So the first part of it, um, it talks about your character is connected to or is part of some noble family. That's all very nice and good. Gives you some sort of quick little backstory uh, should you need it. And it talks about you will meet sort of free characters who are important to you as the scholarly a sort of mentor character you've got the yep. uh the combat person who's going to be teach you how to combat and then you're going to go talk to your childhood friend and it says about encourage your player to do role play now yes. going off what you were saying before that idea of like you are introducing someone to dungeons and dragons and to role play etc that can be very tough. Um, yeah. I, um, yeah. I'm an improviser at heart. I, I love showing off. <laughs> I love acting. And so I don't mind that. But I know certainly when I first did it, I was very, very nervous and actually quite anxious. And that was obviously with the whole group of people yeah. who were willing to try stuff. The only thing I would maybe change about this document is, I, again, I, I did read it, but I don't know if there was like a line in it that said it's, that they're okay to speak in the third person. They don't have to be mm. like, uh, like, oh, you have to put on, it doesn't say anything about character points and accents. says that, yeah, obviously that's, by the way, we all know that yeah. we're all clever and we all play to the top of our intelligences. But it's okay to, if somebody goes, oh, my character, I go over and says this. Uh, and that's fine. It just feels like, I think he says, encourage them. I'm like, I would, but at the same time, I'm not going to push it, you know, because yeah. we don't we don't have time. And maybe they'll come into doing it into, into first person. But at the same time, I, I definitely have been in sessions where a lot of people are speaking in the first person. And then one person who's brand new is like, I'm going to speak in the third person because I just, it's just not for me. I feel a bit awkward about it. That is a very good point. And I, I because... I think there are a lot of people out there who speaking in first person would honestly be a deal breaker for them. And it feels, it feels like a wild thing to me because I really I enjoy, I really enjoy. I think as DMs, we never see this oh. really. Cause right. But yeah. I know, but I know some DMs do speak in the third person as well. They don't go into too mm-hmm. much detail about it, but yeah. I, I recently um, was playing a non D and D RPG and it was one of those ones where you are generating a character very, very quickly. Uh, um, which one may like, I ask? Go for yes, it. it was. Um, I was playing Starcrossed. Oh yeah, uh, with my oh, partner. Right. Yes. Um, it was so. It was so much fun. So delightful. But you were making a character together, mm-hmm. and it was a thing where, like, I was trying to speak as the person, and it was just like this is weird <laughs> because I am just 
like the person was just created from scratch. I had no time to think about how they would sound, how they would act. I don't really know what their, what their personality is like yet. And I'm trying to speak as them. I feel like that's going to, you know, inform the way the plot goes in ways that I don't like. Whereas I, if I can say, oh yes, he, he says something to you and it comes off a little wrong. Um, doesn't quite uh, have the effect that he wants and blah, blah, blah. You know, I, yeah. No, I know. <laughs> I know. And I agree. And I think Starcross, that, that's, that's an interesting thing about Starcross, this idea, because it's, it's about a relationship and using that gender yes. tower. So, and if it falls, you know, something happens and it's, and I think maybe again, it's okay if we're being, I, there was um, a bit of advice that was given recently uh, out of Shutter's Been Sit Down and it's been, it's it's in uh, Grant Howitt's Spire as well. So when you're role playing, imagine that you are WWE wrestlers. That's the level of acting <laughs> you should be, you yes. know? So as a DM, that's great. But I think, yeah, as a, as a player, if you're coming to the first time and you're, being you know, a larger life character that you're talking about stuff at certain topics, which mm. maybe not that you find uncomfortable, but I certainly know with Starcross, obviously that's about a relationship. So yeah. it might be like, uh, I'm talking to my partner. I'm not so sure, et cetera. Uh, it's, it's like, I, I definitely have yet to play Starcross because of a similar thing, but it's a great, I've read the rules of it and it's a great game. So I'm very jealous that you got to play it. Uh, it is, it is very delightful. Um, my partner and I, our first date, uh, we were at a board game bar where we, played Jenga. And so I was just like, okay, we have to, we have to play this game. Like just, just circle. a quick, quick summary for anybody that, that doesn't know uh, Starcrossed. Basic idea is that you are going through a Starcrossed lovers plot line from like a movie or a book. And as things happen to increase the romantic tension between the characters, uh, you pull out a piece of the Jenga tower, put it at the top. And once the tower falls, you act on your feelings. And that could go poorly or it could go well, depending on how well you've done up to that point. It is a delight. And one of the things that they keep saying or in the rules is be obvious. Do yes. the obvious choice. Mm -hmm. If you're if you're thinking, oh, is that too easy? Just do it. And I, whenever we had any sort of doubts about like what we should do, whether, oh, is this is this too cliched? We just do it. And yeah. it made the experience so much more enjoyable, yeah. so fun. I, I really had a blast. I love that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Be obvious. That's, again, uh, I always go back to improv on this, but yeah, they always say be obvious. There's no point in being clever because the audience won't get it. You know, but be obvious is such a good one. <laughs> so yeah, so once you've sort of done that social interaction, like you said, we go into like a little gauntlet tutorial. What I quite like about this, this sort of, I guess maybe that is a bit of exploration in a sense, even though it's quite short. But you get a choice, yeah. uh, a very small choice about where to very go. Very small <laughs> choice. <laughs> they both end up in the same bit, but it's fine. But I do like that. I like the fact that even in this very, like you said, very tight, very sort of like this happens and this happens, sort of like structure. A, you go from A to B. There is still a choice a character yes. can make. And it matters in a sense, because obviously, yeah. you know, if they fail it, they have to go back and go the other route. And that's going to take a bit more time. And it's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it might you as the DM might be like, oh, it means the combat at the end of part one, two, two guards come and you know have that challenge for you fighting. Um, mm -hmm. They could be more prepared. They might yeah. be you know, hiding in wait, both of them, all that sort of thing. So I think maybe if I, you're doing poorly, the mentor like scold, you know, just like, oh, I'm so disappointed. I really thought you'd do better than this. Oh, are you you sure you're you're ready for this uh this teleportation thing that you're doing at the end of the the match yeah. like oh boy and and that's the thing so it builds up this idea that you've been given this information that you're going to this this festival in in, uh, in Waterdeep you're you're doing your last bit of training before you're going to go and join the rest of your family and then the last bit of that part one is go and talk to your old school friend chum uh mm -hmm. which is interesting because like it, again it, it's almost like a commentary that goes through like a meta commentary saying we found that some people actually want to take the friend with us because yeah. i guess because it's built up like you are slightly higher in, in status than the yeah. than your friend and your friend is not jealous it's just sad that if you go off to water deep you might never come back and i'll never see you again <laughs> which i'm like oh, oh this this friend's a bit clingy for my liking but <laughs> i don't know i'm level one so i, I can't talk right <laughs> one one thing they did mention in this which i think it, it now is a uh, appropriate time to bring that up they say, you know, when you're going through this, feel free to tweak the the personalities, genders, appearances, names of any of the characters based on the preference of your player. And what you just said, if your DM was like, oh, I, uh, I know, I know Fiona, I know this, she's going to find this so clingy and bad. <laughs> she's not going to like this. 
but it's in the module. I have to do mm-hmm. it. And I'm a brand new DM. So I don't know that you can change it. Yeah. Um, that is good advice for somebody who's just starting and just doing this for the first time. It's a good reminder that when you're doing a one-on-one campaign, you should craft this specifically for the one person that you're playing with. Yep. You know, for example, when I'm playing with somebody for side character quest and we're doing our sort of initial session zero talks, I make sure to ask them like, Hey, what motivates your character? Because I can't rely on coming up with a motivation that'll work in for, you know, one in three people. It, because if you're the only person and you're not, <laughs> you aren't motivated by this, then it's not going to work. Right. Absolutely. Um, when you're solo DMing as well, the, the idea is so can you sort of segue into it. This idea of obviously session zero is becoming more and more prevalent, mm-hmm. which is great. And this idea of safety tools and stuff also great. And I think it's so important for this one as well, because you, like you said, you want to make sure your player has a good time. They want, you want them to get come yeah. back because so this is only one uh one adventure in in three the first in the trilogy like war but i think for me what i found interesting is that having a session zero is so important for this but like you said i something i again back to improv i always bring it up but there's this thing where obviously we talk about our boundaries what things are off the table mm. you know lines of veils mm-hmm. you know good stuff but naturally when you talk about sad things that make you sad and you want to avoid and people want to protect people that's totally fine it sucks the energy out a little bit and yeah. it feels it feels a bit like admin we get that one thing i've discovered in improv is uh quite similar to what you're saying we call it foundries so it's almost like the opposite of a boundary so what brings you joy what's mm. one thing you would love to see in the adventure and it works very well in big groups as well as well as smaller groups as well Mm-hmm. This idea that, for example, for me as a DM, one of my foundries is that I love crazy solutions uh, things. So, for example, that lich example I gave earlier. So it was a tiny, tiny object, a demi lich, and they were losing, badly losing, yeah. right? And one of the characters went, well, this is a long shot, but could I get my bag of devouring that I gave them ages ago? Can I try and sw- <laughs> gr- swipe or grab the thing <laughs> and put it in? And I was like, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because that is so cool, and I just love that creative. So that brings me absolute joy. Because I think they were like, "We're going to try it," and so that, yeah. that. So that's why I want. I want to have boundaries like that. So having a conversation with your players, like, what brings you joy? And they might not know straight away, yeah. and that's totally fine. They could be like, "Hey, if it comes up, let me know." Afterwards, say, "Oh, I really enjoyed when we had those small emotional moments that don't necessarily move the story along, mm-hmm. but with the with the school friend." You're like, "Great for next time. I'll make sure to build that in, perhaps to have that little encounter, uh, you know, check in with family. That's always yeah. quite cool as well." If you, for example, are, are working with somebody who doesn't want to do a session zero for whatever reason, this could kind of serve as your session zero uh, to some extent, I, yeah. because it it can show them like, "Oh, I really like." Once we got to the combat stuff, it was just like not for me. Or right. oh, I was having a blast, and then every time I had to like talk in character, I was just like, yeah. no thanks. And since you know, again, this is something you can get through in a night, mm-hmm. in an evening, mm-hmm. you can get a lot of information really fast, mm-hmm. uh, which is great. So those are sort of the three sort of main parts of part one. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Ty. Can yes. you tell us what happens in part two? Ah, yes. So part one ends with you using a teleportation spell to teleport to this festival somewhere. But your little antique amulet that you've always worn for whatever reason, mysterious Mm -hmm. amulet, bursts with light as the teleportation spell happens and you get dumped somewhere completely else, not planned, and you find yourself in front of a a dungeon. Yes. Uh, there's not going to be any d- dragons in this uh, adventure, but there not is a dungeon. One. Yes. <laughs> and it's it's up on a mountainside. So obviously, like if you were to just try to go down the mountain, you'd probably, you know, maybe you'd die. Probably uh, die. From yeah. server. So you might as well go inside, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's very specifically designed to be here in part one. We're going to introduce you to the three pillars of D&D. And now we're taking the training wheels off. You no longer are with any of your friends or colleagues unless you decided to bring your, you know, childhood friend along. Oh, gosh. Um, (laughs) uh, (laughs) uh, (laughs) Fine. um, (laughs) Fine. Um, And you immediately, you know, you're 
you're somewhere you you don't know anybody as far as you know you're completely alone but you see that there's a little uh the spoilers there's a little um door on this dungeon that has the same runes as your amulet what? and so that creates a little mystery like oh. ooh, there's something going on and so it just at that point you're just going inside you're exploring and then there's a big boss battle at the end boom bing bang boom yeah awesome What's key here was maybe missing from that first part. Not that the first part needs it, because you've got enough. Like you said, as an introductory level, there's like a little, there's like puzzles, as a sort of thing. Like yes. you know, it just feels like when you step into that first room, this sort of room, uh, the receiving room, and you have maps as well, so you can show yes. the players your maps. And it feels a little bit like an escape room because obviously there is a secret door that mm-hmm. they might see, but they might not see. So, but it tells you about how to help them out if they, you know, if they're struggling to be able to get frustrated because obviously no one wants to be stuck yeah. on a mountain for the rest of it. And yeah, there's a little bit of combat as well. There's some uh, ice menfits. So you Nefits. get methods, methods, uh, yeah, but... some small icy things, which are not, not good news. <laughs> ice methods, you know, when you kill them, they blow up and they cause damage and they were giving advice, which is very, hey, as somebody who has run these <laughs> one player games, this is very good advice. Tone down the damage. So they, they say like, mm. hey, if you roll in crit 20 as a baddie, maybe don't do that double damage yeah when the method dies and does that extra damage and could potentially kill the player maybe they just blow up without having any sort of mechanical reason it's just a Mm. flavorful explosion um and that is very important information Mm. one thing i i love as a dm i love being surprised by my players i love going into stuff not knowing what spells they have, what Mm -hmm. HP they have, anything like that. Mm -hmm. But you need to know HP when you're playing with one person. Absolutely. Because it's fine to knock somebody to zero, but you need to know that you you might do it. Mm -hmm. And you have to have a plan. Yeah, because you don't. Yeah, because you don't want it game over, and then that's it. You don't want it, uh, the GTA, the Elden Ring thing, yes. or whatever. Because uh, you know they won't. There's not really a way to come back from it. I'm sure you could say that, but it's a bit not very fun for the player. But that's interesting that I because I, I did read that about if you get a natural twenty, no, don't do the damage. I completely agree with that. But it makes me think about when I do lower level play, and I used to do it for a long time, like when I did one shots and stuff, lower level play, because I thought that's easiest to run. But I used to be so scared of combat as a result of it because yeah. I didn't want to throw things that would like uh, hurt my players too badly. I wanted them to have a, a decent fight. So mm-hmm. I actually find lower level combat much harder to judge. I don't know how you find it, especially when it's like obviously level one, level two, but even like levels three to five, I really yeah. struggle. Sometimes they'll it'll be a complete pushover because, you know, they've got mm-hmm. magic items or whatever. But then mm-hmm. sometimes they'll come up against something and that's it. What I found with higher level stuff, so this the the radiant citadel one shot we've been doing, it's level fourteen, and I've you know treated them, and they've gone up to fifteen and sixteen. It's so much more fun for me because obviously they'll wail on these creatures, uh, you know, very successfully. I'll add, you know, they've got twenty five to hit, and you're like, yeah, okay, that hits. But then the creatures don't go down, and mm-hmm. I can I can then give it back in kind, and it's so much more enjoyable. And yeah. I don't know. I don't know if you found that at all. Like, so when when you when you obviously you're doing your one on one stuff, is it lower level, or do you organize what level it is between you? Yeah. So I find personally, I enjoy having the world be fairly low, low magic, low level, and there's lore reasons for that. But mostly, it's just because I find that easier to manage um, sure. personally for world building purposes. I find that easier to manage. Mm-hmm. That being said. When I bring somebody onto the show, I usually introduce people at level... I I tell people, you can make your character level three to level five. You can do whatever whatever you want, whatever makes you comfortable, but let me know what level you choose so that I can scale things accordingly. Right. And then if somebody comes back, you know, for a future, uh, for a sequel quest, which has happened a couple of times, then I I bump them up. Oh, cool. I love that personally because for two reasons Mm -hmm. one it means that because the world is populated by like the equivalent of level one level two people it allows the players to shine yes um and without being gods you know yes Um, yeah and then the second thing is i don't have a lot of combat in seq i think in a 98 episodes i would guess that we have had combat in 10 of those 
Oh, yeah, maybe. that's quite impressive. Yeah, yeah, um, it makes sense, I guess, because yeah, if you bring them back, maybe you don't maybe don't have the time and all that sort of thing. And then mm-hmm. that's not where the story goes. That's like, great. Yeah, yeah, we have uh, the show. Generally, maybe it's more. Maybe it would be closer to twenty or twenty-five. But regardless, the show tends to focus on role play and um, exploration more so than combat. But that also means that uh, when there is combat, because everybody's lower level, there is an immediate fear. Mm. Right. of combat which encourages people to find narrative solutions good which tends to be more more interesting for a podcast uh, yeah oh 100 percent. yeah so so like i have had situations where somebody has where combat has started initiative has started and a player has been like oh if this person gets two good hits on me i'm down so in between every fight, every attack, they were trying to talk to the person to be like, hey, maybe we just talk this out. And <laughs> that just made for so much more interesting uh, listening experience. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, like, you know, I think that combat can be incredibly interesting, and incredibly fun just in general. Mm-hmm. But uh, I know that some of the people that I, some of my friends that are listening to the show are listening to it more for the plot and the story and don't right. really care about the D&D side. And so I want to make something nice for them too. Again, there's, there's no right or wrong on this at all. And I completely agree. Some people live for the combat. Like I definitely get definitely. into it and, and definitely work it out. But if you're listening to it, sometimes it gets to a point where you're like, oh, does a 20 hit? Yes, it hits. Okay, I do this much damage. Without that narrative stuff, it gets yeah. really dry. And that's why yes. there's definitely some actual plays, obviously, and in like Critical Role. Dementia 20 does it really well as well. This idea, you know, they will describe, almost over-describe what is happening. Mm-hmm. Make it cinematic. So again, I love that idea of your player saying, let's talk it out. Because it feels so cinematic, like they're, they're fighting, but they're also like, oh no, yeah, they're trying, yeah. you know, it feels movie-like. And that's what, I think that's what a lot of people nowadays who are coming to D and D, coming to role playing games, that's what they want, and that oh, that's what's um, I don't want to say popular or a trend. It's not that. I think that's what people really enjoy about it. And whilst the mm-hmm. the combat also has, serves its own place elsewhere, I definitely enjoy doing combat in my in my games that are off stream, off podcast mm-hmm. stuff because I because then it means I can get into nitty gritty, and it doesn't matter if we're waiting around for fifteen minutes for me to read up my character sheet. The only other thing I sort of wanted to comment about before going on to that, that, like you said, the big finale of the boss. So yeah, so there is this sort of antechamber where you get to do that role play again with the door. Uh, this magical oh, yes. door. Yes, yeah. I forgot about that. I was thinking, I know there was role play in this. Mm-hmm. I cannot remember it. Uh, no. But no, that's a very... Okay, sorry, continue. No, 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 no. Because I think, because this is the thing, I love role playing uh, creatures that are, it's not, yes. and I, I, I don't want to say it's, it's low intelligence or anything like that, but they don't know the answer. So yes. they're, they're playing, they're just playing like honestly and truthfully, but they don't have the answer. So this idea that door does not know how to open itself. I and mean, obviously like with most published adventures and stuff, it'll be like, here are some questions that your player may ask you. Here are some mm-hmm. answers. So this idea, like, who will you make us? Like, mm, that is such a good question. Well, they didn't tell me their names, but they almost never smiled. And when they did, it seemed very mean and creepy. I like you much better. And it's like this idea of moving the story along to be about the player rather than like getting through. And it's like, it's a social encounter, right? It's that idea of trying to get through and work out what it is, which they, they should be able to read, you know, above the door is the answer. But I yeah. love the idea that, because it's the door that has to say the word open. But I love the idea, it's like, no, you need to say this word. What word? Why would I say that? You know, and and like have that little play again. It depends on how much role play your player is doing, obviously. But ah, uh, yeah, I just love that idea of just this back and forth a little bit, like a, almost a, like a almost like a sword fight, but with words. A word play. There you go. That's what I was thinking of. It is so. It's so smart. It's so such a great way to figure that in because it is it is a social encounter that does not doesn't disrupt the reality of this world being like an isolated thing and it also it's a role play encounter that the player has to get through they can't just avoid they have to do it but it's also a puzzle Mm -hmm. and it's also like exploration Mm -hmm. so even if they didn't enjoy really enjoy the first role play they're not going to have the the reaction of like, oh, come on, you're making me talk to somebody again. Mm -hmm. Instead, Mm -hmm. it's a puzzle. So it's part of the game. So even if they're not enjoying the the improv, the acting, they'll still see the point of it and maybe, maybe give it another shot and maybe realize, oh, actually, actually, I do like this. 
there's such a good point, this idea that, yeah, there is a point to it. It's not like, I, again, I've talked about it, Just we've just talked about it just now, this idea that some episodes which are just pure social interaction, you have your shopping episodes, some people absolutely love that. Some mm-hmm. people cannot abide it, they want to get on with it. So this idea yeah. that there is a purpose to this puzzle and you can't move about it. And the, again, it's that idea that whether you spend two minutes on it or 10 minutes on it, it kind of doesn't matter. Um, yeah. yeah, so I like It's that. not taking away from the adventure. It is right. the adventure. Right, exactly yeah. that. And yeah, so and it and it fits in so well. Such a very smart little move. And then finally, like you said, um, there is this big sort of giant, uh, frost giant, I think it is, uh, or storm giant statue, frost giant statue, sorry, uh, that starts to come alive. But then your your newfound friend who is they are described as, let me get it up here. Oh, I've just spilled all of my notes everywhere. No. <laughs> oh no, you fool. Yes, a crystalline paladin. This idea that this creature was made of stone, and then your Amulet, I think it is, that it sort of, all yes. sort of interacts with the runes around them and they start to break free and become unpetrified. Again, it doesn't give you too much in terms of what this person does, the Garen uh, Bronson. Uh, so again, I like that idea that it could be a character that doesn't talk very much or mm-hmm. it's just like, I'm just here to fight or, or, or just like the Witcher, like one word, like run, that sort of thing. Um, run. Oh, yeah. I love it. Yeah, I, I'm working. I'm working with a professional here. That's great. <laughs> but then the sort of final fight in quotation marks. Obviously, you have a few more more of those um, those ice creatures come back, perhaps. But then the frost giant statue starts to come to life. Now, um, I don't know if you know much about frost giants in general, but they're no. they're pretty rough. They're pretty rough. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> they would crush a level one character. So the fact there's there's no point in fighting it, even though yeah. it's a statue. So I like the idea. It says like. You know, as it comes to life, uh, make it clear that they should run. And I think that's another yeah. good point: is that you don't have to fight everything in D anD. d There are times when you're like, "We're outnumbered. We need to go." And yeah. and escape is the point of it. So I just like this idea. That it talks about like it starts to move and it crushes one of the the, the final ice creature under its foot, and that's yeah. the, that's the clue that no, you know, it's not. It's like a small this thing that you. took me so many hits to defeat. It just is dead. It's just exactly. Gone. There is a um, text block that they have that says, we do not have specific stats for the Frost Giant statue. It represents only a force to be escaped. Yep. Fighting is certain death. Yep. <laughs> and, and I think that's really, it's a really good little guide because if I was damning this for the first time and if my player, you know, it says, it says over and over in this, the player will die if they fight the frost giant. They will die. They will die. They are supposed to run. If it had stats and didn't say that, I think, and the player tried to fight it, yeah. I feel like I would let them. Mm-hmm. And and I think that what this is saying is like, you can have them roll and just like, you know, if they want to try to attack it or whatever, Everything they do, you're acting like it's not even phasing this thing. Absolutely. Um, which is a nice little, like a little nudge to this, to the newbie DM running this. You cannot act like they have a chance. They don't have a chance. If you act like they have a chance, you are hurting them. Absolutely agree. And yeah, the way you get out, you roll on this sort of the giant escape table and mm-hmm. they have to do free mm-hmm. success. Tonight. So again, you have that sort of almost Indiana Jones moment, like you're, you're rushing through, you know, could you got to dodge like a big sort of uh, frost swing. You got to climb the rope to get out. It's yeah, yes. it's all there. I love skill challenges. They are my favorite thing in D&D. Anybody that's listened to SQ in the last year will know this. They are the best. Love it. So I, I'm glad that they incorporated something kind of like mm. that into here. Wait, and uh. it makes sense because like you said, like you don't want it to be like, oh, they try and fight this creature. Because like you said, combat is only, well, as we said, combat is only one, yeah. one pillar, right? And also if they've built a character and then they don't get to use their skills, it feels kind of pointless. <laughs> Finally, we end on a cliffhanger. This idea that you you make it out yes. into the into the snow, into this into the mountain where uh, the mountain peak, and you're like, oh, you're safe. And then the huge statue pulls itself out, proper. I feel like Godzilla style or King Kong style. Yeah. <laughs> and and then it and it swings at you, but then it strikes the ground, and that you start to fall in an avalanche, and then that's it. As so the fate to black moment, and you're like, whoa, what next? Uh, Right. The one thing that I will say, and I did not think of this until you were describing this, 
they should have ended on a literal cliffhanger oh. of like you you're falling in this avalanche you grab like a cliff and you're holding on it onto it and then it fades to black yeah you you that have yourself be... you have your new warrior friend and then you have remy at the back like yeah. all of three of you <laughs> oh yeah. that'd be so good that'd be so good oh well thank you so much ty for introducing me to this i think like when i was looking for like i'm a really big fan of doing one on one Mm-hmm. like uh, sessions and doing D&D for newbies and stuff like that. But there isn't, as far as I'm aware, you know, again, this is me saying I'm not an expert. There doesn't seem to be any official fifth edition. Here is a one-on-one player. I think there are solo ones. but As far, uh, as, I'm, I, as, far as I'm aware, you're right. I, yeah. I don't know of any examples. Because um, obviously I know there's this big push about like, oh, well, you can have sidekicks and stuff, which is absolutely fair. But you know, it's nice to read something like you said. It's very tight. It's very easy. It's very flexible. And it has a lot there. And it doesn't punish mm-hmm. players for trying out new things or anything like that. And it's only one in a, a trilogy as well. So you could yeah. continue the story going on. When we're talking right now, uh, it is in October. And one of the other options these people had were these horror themed mm-hmm. one player adventures. I feel like I might check those out because I love me a, a horror themed. D and D adventure, and based off of how this went, I think I think that these guys are these guys are professionals in designing <laughs> little one player games. So yeah, it's it's nice. Yeah. Um, oh, that's lovely. I love that. So yeah, so that is D and D Duet is their website, D and D Duet dot com, and that is Jonathan and Beth Ball. We'll put a link to their stuff in the uh, show notes. But Ty, thank you so much for joining me. I'm going to say that's the end of the episode because we have gone through this. It's been an absolute joy to meet you. And it's been an absolute joy to talk to you and discuss all D&D things with you. Uh, before we sign off, um, is there anything you'd like to plug? Where can we listen to and, and find out more about Side Character Quest? So you can find Side Character Quest on all of your favorite podcast apps. You can also find it at sidecharacterquest.com. I am on Twitter as win, lose, tie. That's Ty, T-Y. Amazing. Uh, and then my podcast is on Twitter at SEQ Podcast. Really truly take a listen to uh to side character quest i promise it is good if you listen to it uh, at a quest and you're like oh this isn't for me send me a tweet and i will give you a custom recommendation tell wow. me what you didn't like about it and i'll give you one that i think will fit with you that's awesome um, <laughs> When I'm not getting people's names wrong and podcast names wrong uh, <laughs> and and then talking very excited about, about D&D for an hour, uh, you can find me on the What Am I Rolling podcast, which is a twice monthly RPG one shot podcast. As always, it's going very well. Oh, let me tell you, Ty, there are so many systems. <laughs> there are so many systems that I'm doing and, and running now. We've had lots of interviews that have come out from Free League Publications. They've been doing stuff like... Uh, into the odd they've done um uh, dragon bane which is sweden's number one rpg so instead of having Dungeons and dragons they had dragon bane uh which is a really fun exciting really? yeah it's really fun, fun and exciting this uh, for them because in the original uh I, again i'm gonna get this right i think I believe it's in the original swedish it's called draken de Moor, which is uh Ooh, that sounds good dragons and demons and, yeah. <laughs> and i'm gonna get this wrong now so i believe you roll a, a d20 if you've got a one that's a demon and if you've got a 20 it's a, a dragon i think that's how it Ooh. was um yeah recommend it they've got the quick start out now uh, unfortunately the, the kickstarter for that is finished but it will be out soon yeah. uh like it, it's a very exciting time for them so that's free league stuff and other one shots will be out soon finally 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 also 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 we have an <laughs> offer code uh for first space gaming your friendly local game store in burnley so my neck of the woods unfortunately ty uh they don't give give anything to the us but i'm sure you have friendly local game stores um yeah. so you can you can go look at those yeah. if you yeah, if you type in the offer code DMBC into checkout, you can get ten percent of your first order. Dragonlance is probably going to be out by the time this comes out, uh, so maybe put the pre-order on that. But if not, there'll be terrain and stuff. But also go check out if they've got any uh, one-on-one games, perhaps. Like, and maybe they'll have yes. a. If you probably with uh, friendly local game stores, you can order through certain RPGs. So maybe Starcrossed would also be a good one to check in on that one. Thank you so much uh, for for being on this podcast. <laughs> Thank you for having me. This has been delightful. This is this can all just be bloop stuff. Uh, hey, it's Thanksgiving is right around the corner. Spread your thanks. And if hey, you know what, if the spirit does not move you uh, it, it, right now to do that with side character quest, if let's say that this SEQ is not uh, not something that you are particularly thankful for, send it. Just sit down. This is something that I do every year. Um, sit down with your laptop for like 
20, 30 minutes on Thanksgiving Day. And <laughs> maybe not on Thanksgiving Day. Um, but at some point this week, sit down and just shoot shoot little like emails or reviews to like various internet creator people that you is it weird that i do this i don't know uh but just shoot out emails to people and say like hey i appreciate the stuff that you make and i yeah do that it's nice it's a nice thing to do it feels good all right this wow this intro has gone way longer than i intended um bye enjoy dm's book club